My name's Neil Selwyn and greetings from Melbourne. For this contribution to the State of Data 2020, it didn't really make sense to blithely talk about any of the digital education issues that I'd have probably gravitated towards a few months ago. Pre-pandemic, I'd have been really keen to expand upon questions about datification in schools, AI in education, digital labour, and a whole bunch of other hot topics. But at this particular moment of time, and I'm recording this at the end of May 2020, it feels important to keep thinking about what the ongoing crisis means for education and technology. So of course, all the things that we were worrying about pre-COVID-19 remain just as important as ever, but we obviously need to rethink and reframe them through the lens of this pandemic and its aftermath. I think it's clear that the current upheavals are gonna have a lasting impact on education and the ways that education and technology come together for years to come, if not decades. These are important changes that we need to factor into our discussions of digital education. This is not business as usual. This is not the new normal. This is a time of fast moving reform of public education and we need to be kick-starting some serious conversations and pushback. So this is a 12 minute presentation. So my main take home message is that there needs to be two aspects of the conversations that should be started and that we need to be working hard on both fronts. First is the short term work that needs to be carried out right now to establish satisfactory forms of emergency remote schooling for the remainder of the pandemic. And second is the long term work that also needs to be started now to ensure that the pandemic is not used as an excuse to push through the corporate reform of public education, but instead might perhaps act as a catalyst to reimagine a better state of education for us all. So let's start off with number one, these short term priorities what I see the immediate problems that face us. I guess the main take home message here is that I think emergency schooling is here to stay and we need to be starting conversations about how to do it better next time. What we've just been through this March, April, May is clearly not the end of the story. In Europe and Australia, I worry that we're all so relieved to be coming out of our initial lockdowns that there's been very little discussion about the ongoing and recurrent nature of these educational disruptions. Our schools might well now be reconvening in dribs and drabs, but we're still going to have a large amount of students continuing to learn on a remote basis for some time to come. And until the pandemic has finally subsided and or a vaccine is found, going back to school is going to be a highly contingent and uncertain process. So it's really difficult to predict what's going to happen, but it seems a safe bet to explain that this initial period of lockdown that we're just coming out of might well be followed by others. As we're seeing in China and Singapore, Individual schools are likely to going to be required to return to shutdown conditions as soon as local cases surface in the community. So there's going to be second and third waves all around the world, in which case a lot of us are going to have to be going through this whole process all over again. So if this is not going to be the last that we've seen of the remote schooling um, arrangements and school shutdowns, students having to learn at home through remote education, we need to prepare accordingly. Clearly, the past few months have seen teachers, students, families and schools making huge efforts to get by the best they can. And it's been amazing to see people swing into action. But all of this has come at a cost. Most families and schools are exhausted and there have been huge differentials between schools and between households in terms of what it's been possible to achieve. The prospect of having to do all this again in the near future should be prompting conversations about what we need to be doing differently next time. In the short term, we urgently need to instigate a thorough debrief and audit that covers everything that's just taken place. We need local and perhaps national audits of how the current lockdown arrangements went, and we need to document disadvantage and celebrate success. Now, for sure, there have been plenty of success stories that are worth supporting and sustaining, but also for sure, we need to call out the professional practices and the institutional procedures that clearly fell short. For example, is it okay for teachers to be hosting five hours of live Zoom classes a day? Is it okay for schools to be reporting parents to state child abuse hotlines if students are failing to log on to the school system? We need to identify what's gone okay and we need to identify what's not gone okay, all with the intention of preparing properly for the next time. At the moment, people seem to be talking in vague terms of how well they think blended approaches might go over the next few months. But anything that happens won't be blended, but will have to be flexible. There's inevitably going to be a need for improvisation, but we don't want to leave everything up to the last minute again. So I think we need to take the time right now to reflect on our mistakes, to avoid getting into bad habits and to learn from the experiences of others in comparable circumstances. And then armed with all of this evidence, we need to work out ways of doing emergency remote schooling better next time the situation arises over the next months and perhaps even years. And there's a whole bunch of questions here I think we can ask. You know, what scope is there to develop rapid professional learning for teachers? How can teachers, parents and others share experiences? And by this, I mean generate useful reflection and transparent discussion on what people have just been through. 
best practice is always local, and digital education is highly situated and contextually contingent. What scope is there for parental advice and parental training, establishing systems of support and resourcing for households that are going to find themselves recast again as places of schooling? What additional infrastructure needs to be put in place, digital and analogue? And what guidelines and policies can be developed with regard to data privacy, child protection, governance and accountability? A lot of this has to be local, but I'm really interested to see what scope there is for national and regional governments. So there's heaps to think through here, and we have a limited amount of time to do this thinking. There's already been some interesting blue skies thinking emerging. You might have seen Tim Brighouse and Bob Moon talking about establishing an open school in the same way that we established the open university during the late 60s. Personally, I'd like to see subsidies for devices and internet access, government policies to suspend internet caps for families under lockdown, and maybe support for paraprofessionals who might support families under remote schooling conditions. There's a lot that can be done, but there's not much time to act, and we need to have these conversations. But this is only half the story. Coming on to my second concern, the longer-term priorities, we have to contend with the longer-term ramifications of all of this. And here I just want to make the point that I think we need to have serious discussions about the long-term conditions that are being established under the radar of the current panic about COVID. The pandemic is accelerating a lot of longer-term trends, plans and agendas, which are currently being enacted under the guise of being emergency short-term fixes, but I'm concerned look set to be with us for the long term. Outside of education, we can see this in the haste with which surveillance, tracking and tracing apps are being hurried out without due oversight and regulation. And inside education, we can see this in the haste with which universities are being encouraged to merge, close down or pivot to industry relevant short courses. And we can also see this in the rapid shift there's been to establishing contracts and with platforms such as Zoom, Google, Microsoft and the like. So I think we need to be super mindful about pushing back now against some of these emergency actions and logics which are being hastily put into place. At the moment, the global pivot to remote teaching has been used as an excuse to justify some long-standing ambitions for the longer-term radical rethinking of education. Frederick Hess observed in the first few weeks of the lockdown that a few education analysts have started to sound positively giddy about this exciting opportunity to spitball ideas and try out nifty programmes. When we've seen since then, edtech enthusiasts get into gear. People like Sal Khan talking about the silver lining of COVID or Stephen Heppel gleefully talking about the genie being left out of the bottle. And Andrew Cuomo, state governor of New York, I think nailed this sentiment best when arguing for a permanent switchover to a sophisticated remote learning across the whole of the state's education system. Now these claims about getting rid of the old mode of education is serious stuff. US commentators are currently quite rightly horrified by the idea of Eric Schmidt and the Gates Foundation being handed the keys to reform New York schooling. But you can see why state authorities and city leaders are keen to go this way. And this is happening all around the world. And I worry that a lot of people in education are currently too exhausted and knocked out of shape to do much in opposition. These are all appealing cost-saving measures in the face of the impending global financial meltdown. But the infrastructures that we choose to build now in response to the current crisis are going to haunt public education for decades to come. And at the moment, you can see policymakers and education leaders setting up dangerous precedents for key issues of concern, such as the increased use of proprietary platforms, increased classroom automation, increased surveillance-led teaching, worries about data protection, and the overall entrenchment of the corporate reform of educational processes through the enactment of digital technology. If these are taken to their logical conclusion, then such shifts are going to fundamentally alter the conditions and characteristics of public education. So this quote here from Woodrow Hartzog is referring to the rapid rush to COVID surveillance and tracking apps, but his words are equally as applicable to educational technology. Once the technology infrastructure is established, there's always an inertia to change it back. So we need to be watchful that these ongoing COVID-19 disruptions are not misused to force radical educational reforms by those who stand to profit directly from them. Instead, we need to initiate a new set of discussion points. For example, it could be argued that COVID-19 has blown apart the idea of the technological fix and has exposed the limitations of digital technology and Silicon Valley for what they are. We've seen COVID tracing apps failing spectacularly in comparison to manual tracing techniques. We've seen millions of dollars invested in thermal cameras that are next to useless in identifying anyone suffering from COVID-19 as opposed to a common cold. And elsewhere, we're suddenly seeing the limitations of AI systems that find themselves lacking the appropriate training data to adapt to these extraordinary times. So in short, the pandemic is already teaching us that tech will not save us. And this message definitely needs to be said more often and more loudly in educational contexts. 
And in fact, I say COVID-19 could be reframed as a moment where people are now well aware of the social limitations to the promises of education technology and are willing to think otherwise. You can now talk to school leaders and policymakers about the digital divide and digital inequalities and people realise that this is a real problem. You can talk to parents and teachers about the crappy nature of platform-based education and they've got first-hand experience. So this is a period where we have a very critically engaged public and professional body when it comes to having difficult conversations about ed tech. And interestingly, you could also argue this period has seen some innovations that we might like to argue are worth fighting to keep. For example, it's been surprising that countries like Australia have suddenly been able to completely suspend nationwide standardised testing of children. This is a welcome precedent that's now been set. It's been great that governments have been able to suddenly subsidise laptops and Wi-Fi connectivity for poor families otherwise lacking access. This is a welcome precedent that's now been set up. And in some ways, we could look forward to continuing the momentum of these logics to continue investing in our social safety net and educational infrastructure. There's lots of work to be done and there's lots of conversations to be had about what we need to do in the wake of COVID-19. We need to work hard to make sure these conversations are not just about tech issues and led by tech interests. What's going to happen in the next few months and years is not a tech issue. There's no quick tech solutions. We need to pivot these conversations firmly towards the heart of the matter and make sure that these conversations are led by education and society. Currently, we're seeing a big pile-on of tech firms and philanthropics. We're also seeing a big pile-on of smaller egg tech boosters and evangelists. Instead, it would be great to have a reverse mindset of letting educators, students and parents have the first go at working things out and only then going to the tech lobby and telling them what, if anything, is required. And this might well result in some very different solutions being proposed. So to cut a long story short, I guess the take home message of what I'm arguing here is the conversations that we now need to have about education and digital technology should be radically different than what seems to be unfolding at this very moment. And those of us that feel passionate about public education and are critical about digital education need not to make the mistake of watching from the sidelines. We need to get involved and we need to get involved quickly.